Hey, and welcome back to another episode of Off the Beaten Path. Today's installment is the final of three from a recent trip I took to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and in this episode, we'll be touring the home studio of Mike Dawson. I'm sure plenty of you are already familiar with Mike, whether through the writing he did as managing editor of Modern Drummer Magazine, his podcast he co-hosted with Mike Johnston, or his current content he's created in tandem with Drum Factory Direct. And if you're all caught up on this series, you probably watched my recent episode with Drum Factory Direct, where Mike walked us through their headquarters. In addition to all of his work within the drum industry, Mike is also an active performer and session musician. The space he's built at home for creating content, live streaming, and remote sessions is a great example of how productive you can be with a spare room in your house. Before we get too far into the video, I want to remind you that I'm creating new episodes in this series each month, so if you want to be the first to know when I release new videos, please consider subscribing to my channel. And with that said, let's take a look inside Mike Dawson's home studio. What's up? Cool. Hey, Mike. Welcome to my laundry room. <laughs> yeah. Huge, vast 12 by 12 office. But the good thing is the ceilings are about eight feet. That's kind of rare in a basement. Well, before we get too far into the space and talking about everything you do in here, could you just give me a brief background on how you got started with drumming and how your career has gotten to this point? How brief can I make it? I started playing drums when I was nine because Living Color put out their first album, Vivid. I was in fourth grade. I was at a table with two boys who had drums and a girl. I did not have drums. They kept talking about drums and how cool Living Color was. I wanted to be able to impress the girl that are at our table, so I got drums that Christmas, 1988, nine years old. That started it. So the whole time, my whole life as a kid was like punk rock and trying to be a rock star and then also going through the academic side, which is really cool. I had some great teachers and great mentors, but I kind of kept, I kept one foot in the indie rock punk world at all times to kind of remind myself like what I wanted to do. Cause I, I could have gone down the classical world super deep, but I just wanted to rock out with my friends, you know, played in like regionally successful rock bands. Actually, the actor Sean Hattesey was the lead singer in my band. I was teaching private lessons. I was in the marching band. I was in the Allstate Orchestra. I was in a community big band. I was in a classic rock band with my uncle. We were playing house parties and I was in this, this band that we were trying to be famous with my friends and we were playing all the shows around. So there was no difference. Um, it was just all music. It was all just cool. And it was just fun. I mean, I don't, I stay at, and I was doing musical theater, so it was just everything. I was, it was small towns. So I was like one, one of one, really. So yeah, for me, it's always been pursuable and it's still that way. I still have original projects and I work for hire and, you know, I teach and it's just, I don't know how you can specialize. So I do envy my friends like Mark Juliana, who says, you know, he said years ago, I'll, I will never play a cover band gig. That's just not what he's going to do. Cool. He made it work. I can never make that work. <laughs> yeah, and I think myself too, it's like I live in a smaller market. And I think I could play a lot of live jazz or one narrow genre, but I definitely couldn't make a comfortable living right? and be on call any given night. You know, it's diversity was important in the kind of work I wanted to pursue in my area, so. Yeah, and finding something that's cool about everything. I don't love playing weddings, but there's something cool about it. You know, like I'm playing to a click, so that's a whole other challenge. And sometimes the leader's throwing the click on in the middle of a song just to make sure we're correct. You know, like those things, like that's, that's some experience that you're not gonna get in any other situation. Or exactly, most. yeah. My parents were like, well, if you're gonna go to school for music, what are you gonna do when you're done? You gotta have a job. So that was the compromise. I'll get a music ed degree, but when I was student teaching, right before I graduated, I realized this is not in any way, shape or form what I want to do with my life. I took a couple years off, gigged, went to grad school at University Arts in Philadelphia, strictly for jazz studies masters. That's when I met um, Rick Van Horn, the former senior editor of Modern Drummer. He was teaching there at the time and I was assigned to be his graduate assistant. So he also taught a class, music journalism, and I was in that class. So I just realized I had a talent for that. And he called me out like halfway through the semester, like you, your, your natural ability to edit is like really, really good. So I want to keep you in mind if we ever have a position open. So literally 
the week after I graduated, they offered me a job at Modern Drummer. So I can't say I, I had anything to do with that. <laughs> it was just the universe like kind of funneling me, steadily funneling me to this opportunity. Yeah. And, and I just took it very seriously and it turned into a career. So I was at Modern Drummer for almost 17 years. And I, as soon as I got the gig, my number one thought was every time I get a chance to interview someone, I'm going to treat it like a private lesson. So whoever it is, I'm going to go as nerdy as I need to, to feel like I'm, I'm growing as a, as a drummer, as an educator, as a artist for that experience. So yeah, interviewing Benny Greb for a couple hours and Steve Jordan hanging out at the hit factory in New York for like three hours interviewing him. I actually played while he was doing his photo shoot. I was playing piano with him. So getting to feel what it's like to play with Steve Jordan, I'm still trying to process all that information that I gathered. I mean, all my heroes except for Vinny Cayuta, I've interviewed. Matt Chamberlain, Glenn Kochi, and even the ones that I didn't really know ahead of time. Zach Hill, Chris Adler with Lamb of God. So yeah, it was unreal. But I took that very seriously as well. Like, I'm not just going to ask the simple questions. I want to ask, like, the real stuff. Steve Jordan. How do you know if something's grooving or not? I asked him that. His answer was amazing. If you have to ask that question, you're probably not grooving. Yeah. <laughs> After you wrapped up your time at Modern Drummer, that's when you came out here to Pittsburgh, right? Since we all worked remote, my wife and I were able to consider where we wanted to live. Like we didn't have to live in New Jersey anymore. So we started looking at Pennsylvania. Right around that time, I got a random LinkedIn message, which I never checked LinkedIn ever. For some reason, I went on LinkedIn and there was a direct message uh, from this guy, Matt, asking me if I'd be interested in writing product descriptions for a website, Drum Factor Direct. And he sent me links to stuff like in the style of like this, like we want some long form articles and product descriptions and here's some things that we're thinking of. All the links that he had sent me went back to Modern Drummer content that I had either created or was the lead editor on. And he didn't, he didn't realize that he was talking to that person. I was like, well, that's cool because that was my story. So let's go. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> Originally, it was freelance. We just need someone to do rewrite descriptions. But then the more we talked and you realized that who I was and my experience was like, well, we actually need somebody to just head up our creative department. So let's talk full time. So I did both jobs for like three months and then finally resigned for Modern Drummer once we got settled here. And so this room we're in now is like, functions not only as a place where you can play drums and live stream out of, but also like an office where you can record podcasts or do work yeah. with the computer. So this space, as soon as we moved in, um, I knew this was going to be my primary office and I contacted Mitch over at Audio Mute because he had done amazing work with my buddy Carter McLean. And I just wanted to get some of these sheets. These are absorption sheets. So Mitch called me up. He's like, dude, nah, we're going to design you something cool. So we just got talking and I said, well, I really like, like, I like surrealism. I like, I like Monet and Van Gogh, like that style of art. And his team created basically a Van Gogh background for me to, to live in every day. So I have it designed. So the corner with the computer here, the camera shoots right into the corner. So you get that kind of cool vantage point. And then I also wanted to make sure I could live stream. So Shout out to Dan Stone for letting me borrow his old PC streaming computer. I got four cameras set up here so I can live stream. I can record quick product demos for work. I can do private lessons on Skype. It was like the Wild West in the beginning. If you go back to the first season of the Drum Candy podcast, it was in this room, but I had a clear sonic booth that I brought with me because I had that in my old house. I was using my laptop. I was recording my audio on a cheap old Zoom H2. Then I got this Yeti. So that's my mic for when I'm doing the podcast now. USB, I can actually sync it right up with Zoom. I'm about to get away from Zoom because I'm really tired of, of the way that looks and sounds. So yeah, just that old ring light. Like I've just been buying bits and pieces. Some DSLRs will shut off after 30 minutes. Yeah. So I had to get one that won't do that for, for the bot because I kept having to like go up and reset it. So I've, I've learned all the, all the mistakes. Efficiency is a big factor. It's like, yeah. I don't need the highest quality preamp and audio interface, a USB mic. I can just plug in and it'll record right away. Yeah. 
I mean, I've spent so many years studying audio engineering that I feel like I can get what I need from whatever. Um, that was a benefit of studying that stuff in college. I mean, I, I did years of that. So I feel like I can make the audio work. It's the lighting and the cameras that's been like, how the heck do you do that? Like I'm still, and again, it's like piecemeal. These are cameras that Drum Factory Direct had bought years ago. These Panasonic's GH5, GH5S, and then some GH2s. So I did invest in some nice Amaran 100Xs. It's, it's never ending, that side of it is, it, but it's fun. Like I like to discover something that I can't do and how do I figure it out? So that's fun to me. But I did keep this particular setup cheap, lo-fi, simple, deliberately, audio wise. So I don't want to use this space for multi-track recording, although I could. Really cheap, old Alesis iMulti Mix 8, which has an, an old iPod freaking recording. Oh, a stand. Yeah, that's how old it is. So I'm literally running a bass drum mic, Beta 52A, a blue Dragonfly overhead. That's my microphones into that iMulti Mix. And then I have the Yamaha E8010, which has a stereo mic. And then I run all that into, just because I had it, this cheap EQ and I have this cheap compressor limiter and it goes into this interface, two channels for OBX. It's always tweaking though. So who knows what it'll be. And I'm like, I've never, this drum set is ridiculous. You came at a weird time to see me with 8, 10, 12 with yeah. hydraulic heads on it. So this is just my, my fun house. Every week it's a different snare, different symbols. I just got these 15s from Chris Hawthorne. You do have a few different choices here. I see another kit in the corner. Yep. And then a few snares at your disposal to swap out. <laughs> you were kind of telling me before, you've got another room where you do that sort of work, where if you are going to multi-track or where you can pick and choose from a wide variety of instruments. Yeah, it's right behind this wall. So let's go check All it right. out. So much livelier. You probably hear it in the, uh, the microphone. But yeah, this is a 25-ish by 13 by, I think, eight and a half foot ceilings cinder block walls so i had to deal with that um so just recently i had mitch come back in and audio mute and he designed this amazing um feature wall behind the drums with some prototype material that he's working on it's designed to look kind of like a stone if you want to see this wall this is the new feature wall that's going to be used for all the drum candy multi-person podcast episodes and i'm also in pre-production to do product demos of every drumstick that Drum Factory Direct sells. So I'm gonna be sitting at this table doing the talking head job there. So this is the new space. I like the idea of having that room to do like rough and ready demos, but then like, do you really wanna hear what this drum head sounds like with mics on it? Then we're gonna do it in here as well. So you gotta do both. I, I get the like, show me the product in its natural state, 100%, but also, I'm, I record drums for a living, so I want to hear what they sound like under microphones too, so. I think that's really cool that you guys are doing that because a lot of companies will make a promo video of a kit or a large ticket item, but to go through every model of stick and kind of give a thoughtful analysis of why you might purchase this over another that is just a few millimeters different thickness yeah. or a different tip shape. It's a big project, but I'm starting with the signature sticks because that gives us the most kind of juice to start with. You know, sure. I, can, I can grab some content of the drummer playing them and then the specs are usually kind of more customized. Like the, the Carter McLean stick is very, that's that's a Klaus Hessler, but so I'll, more to talk about, but eventually it's going to be every stick, describe the features, show it, play it on the cymbal, play it on some drums. You seem to have relationships with different companies and more artists and craftsmen making drums and cymbals. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you got there and some of the people you've been able to work with in crafting your own instruments. Yeah, it goes back to being managing editor, modern drummer. When I shifted into product specialist mode, I was meeting all these craftsmen, these custom shop. Like we're in a we're in an era of amazing craftsmanship. Um, and I was meeting all these, these folks that were just building incredible instruments. So I made sure in each issue of the magazine, at least one of these more kind of boutique custom shops were featured because, you know, DW will love them. They don't need the press. They're DW. Yeah. 
these custom shops. I mean, literally this guy, Chris Carr, who makes Bucks County drums, he does all this stuff himself by hand. And this was an innovative shell. It's got a solid core, like stave, like a thin stave shell core. And he was gluing up like three plies of maple on the outside to help stabilize it and putting re-rings in it. So it's like a hybrid solid ply shell. So we became super close and he's always bouncing ideas off of me and sending me stuff to check out. And, and I'm, you know, we're just back and forth collaborating on tons of stuff. So that that's what started it. Um, same thing with Nikki Moon. Um, he reached out to me on Instagram years ago and asked me to be an endorser. He was like, I love your plan. Your, your aesthetic is a perfect match for what I'm doing. You want to be an art artist? And I had to tell him, well, I can't be an endorser because I was working at Modern Drummer, but I would love to review some of your stuff. Ended up buying a bunch of stuff. These he designed specifically for me. I've since become an artist of his since I, I left Modern Drummer, but I told him I wanted, I wanted Steve Gadd from Chick Corea Three Quartets. Like, give me that cymbal sound. And he came up with these and he called them the Sage Series. Who would think to drill holes in the bell to, to dry it out? But that's what he did. And these are reversible hi-hats. So it's not a top and a bottom, it's just two cymbals. So you can get the, the Steve Gadd like bottom on top sound by flipping it or you can go kind of more classic. This is a sugar percussion drum that I made. I went out to his his factory before COVID actually it was the February of 2020 and he was doing this workshop where you could build your own snare. This is a freaking Alaskan yellow cedar drum that I made at his workshop and he's another freak. I mean his attention to detail is just is unreal. So just getting to know all these folk, Doc Sweeney, Steambent Elm, amazing. Masters of Maple. This drum was made for Dave Grohl and it caused such an absolute uh, PR nightmare. <laughs> if you remember Grohl did that, um, it was called Play or something where he went around a room and, and built a song from scratch, played all the instruments and went around in a circle. Okay, yeah. It was a fundraiser. He played Masters of Maple Drums in that video and DW went ballistic. But still, it's an amazing drum. It's the Acrolyte Killer. And it sounds incredible. Got this real ridiculous badge. <laughs> <laughs> These drums to me are more like reminders of my friendships of all the badass people I've met over the years. Johnny Craviato, Shell, one of the last ones that he bent. Solid Drums in Switzerland, another amazing craftsman. One dude making drums, sourcing the wood. He gives you the coordinates of where the wood came from when you buy the drum. It's just, there's so many cool people. GMS, here we go. First drum I ever had custom made for me. Vaughn Craft used to, were like the premier solid shell maker at a time. They sent me this flamed birch, timeless timber flame birch shell. They sent me a whole bunch of shells. And they were like, just keep one of them that you like and you can build a drum out of it. At the time, it was when Keith Urban put out the song Sweet Thing, excuse me, with Chris McHugh on drums. That snare drum sound still haunts me to this day. And I emailed Chris, because I had met him through Modern Drummer, like, what drum did you use on Sweet Thing? Just tell me. He told me it was a Joyful Noise, Timeless Timber, Flame Birch. This shell. So I just had the raw shell, and I was like, well, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so I called my friends at GMS, and I was like, can you just make a drum for me out of this and have it sound like Chris McHugh on Sweet Thing? And I nailed it. I probably used this drum. This is the most used wood drum that I own, for sure. It's probably been on a couple hundred records. Collaborating with the builder, same thing with Chris, with all the Bucks County stuff. He's always asking me, what, what do I want? What's the sound that you're looking for? That species on that kid, I had no, no interest in discussing. I was like, I just want these drums to be small drums that sound big. Whatever you need to do to make small drums sound big. And they're yellow heart. Whatever that is. I never would have picked Yellow Heart. Yeah, I don't think there's any major <laughs> drum brand just, you know, offering, yeah, this is our Yellow Heart series. Yeah, right. You know? Another thing, too, is like, aside from the stories and having these as memories, there's also a functionality of like, 
A lot of drums that are well-made, we talk about versatility, but in your position when you're recording, sometimes it's nice to have 10 drums that I'll do 10 specific things. And when I want this sound, I grab that drum. I don't take this other drum and tune it. Mm. Cause that way a week from now, when you want that same drum tuned up high where you like it, it's ready to go. That's what this top shelf is. So <laughs> these are literally my top shelf drums. Tight, medium, medium, low, low metal six and a half. So that's nickel over brass. That's the classic superphonic. That's a six lug aluminum. That's a weird black or light that I have tuned all the way down and dead. If I need a deep drum, I got my four flavors of metal, shallow metal, tight, medium, tight, medium, low, super low. To be honest, most of my studio work is these. Then I have my three woods, tight, medium, low. I could cover anything with these. Everything else is just variations and flavors. I went through the Steve Jordan video, um, The Groove Is Here, do you know that? Yeah. And I matched every drum in the video to a different snare drum that I owned. So these are all my Steve Jordan sounds. Super deep and dead, shallow and dead, kind of the um, P-Funk sound, deep and wide open wood for the Sheryl Crow sound, old ratty super high deep super high medium tuned wood hoop and then the 213s are over there so these are all like steve jordan world perfectly matched to those snare sounds on that video <laughs> yeah <laughs> so they're ready to go if someone says i need p-funk that's the drum someone like steve jordan is pretty iconic through multiple eras yeah so it's like that probably is a request i want the john mayer Trio vibe. Vultures, boom, right yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> you probably do enjoy picking the right equipment. That's like a fun process and I yeah. enjoy that and getting a drum to match this sound that I love. But the real passion is still playing. So it's mm -hmm. like, I don't want to spend all day right. tweaking with drums and, and adjusting microphones or setting up a different kit and swapping out. It's like, I'm really here to play. Yeah. So as quick as you can get through all this stuff, yeah, and like that, important. a good good case in point, some drums just inspire me. Tempro, basically a pearl stencil drum. I, I think I gave Chris over at Hawthorne a hundred bucks maybe for it. It it doesn't sound good, but it sounds amazing, and yeah. it just makes me play. If I if I need to do anything that's a little bit quirky and weird, Billy Martin, I I can't get any other drum to do it. I could spend all day trying to get my beautiful Craviato to sound like trash. When this just sounds like trash in all the right ways. This Slingerland student model, this is a bit of a hidden gem. It was like their answer to the Acrolyte, but it's like really crummy version of an Acrolyte. Super thin and it's got a big, it's like a Frankenstein drum with bolts all everywhere. It's ratty in all the cool ways. This is my like um, meters, Zigaboo. Okay. It just does it right away. And it's also not loud. So you can hit it really hard and the microphones don't freak out. Same thing with this tempo. These quieter drums, you can really smack them and it's not like obliterating your overhead mics and stuff. Here's my other two, Steve Jordan. A solid cherry that I actually designed with um, Bruce Hagwood at RBH Drums, another amazing custom shop for a special modern drummer project. I told Bruce, I want something that sounds like Steve Jordan's signature drum. I think you might be the first person I've met who has six Steve Jordan <laughs> drums. You have a whole shelf of Steve Jordan sounds. Yeah. yeah. This is the, another solid cherry. One of these drums that didn't work out right, Bruce just cut it down and made basically like a, what's the Ludwig Piccolo called that everyone spends way too much money on? That's what Steve uses is a Ludwig. That sounds exactly like it. Ludwig, I think, still makes the best snare drums on the planet, quite honestly. Yeah. This is one that gets overlooked. Chrome over brass. New. B-stock. You can find these for like 500 bucks. It beats my Black Beauty in a lot of ways. But, you know, several hundred dollars cheaper. This was my primary gigging drum for a long time. They're amazing. Get the B-stock ones. There's nothing, literally nothing wrong with them, except for there's like a, a welding blemish or something inside of it. This is the Slingerland version of that from the 50s, chrome over brass. 
Um, someone had told me, Harry Kangany, I think, had told me that this the shell was the same as a slingle in Black Beauty. They just chromed it. I got this out of the trash at my high school, put it together, and it was my, it's been, I mean, I've used it hundreds, if not thousands of gigs, and it sounds amazing. And you can probably find these for a couple hundred bucks used. There's different versions. This one doesn't have the, the beads, the stripes. Yeah. And then the more common version is like this one that has the three. So the 50s ones don't. There's like one, one catalog when they didn't have stripes. Slingerland is the, is the black sheep, I think, of, of vintage American drums. And I love them. All my vintage kits are in storage except for two of them. This one and the Ludwig over there. 1965 Gene Krupa setup with the matching solid maple snare. 13, 16, 22. Uh, exact same setup that John Bonham used on Led Zeppelin 1. Same color, actually. Wow. Yeah, that's not really what he's associated <laughs> right? with equipment-wise. But if you listen to that first record, it's smaller sounding drums. And he, he didn't use the matching snare. He used the 5x14 Supra, not the deeper one. At the time when I was starting to collect vintage drums, it was like all these baby boomers were retiring and moving to Florida. So this was on Craigslist. A uh, family had to sell this house because they were moving to Florida. Super cheap. So I went over and met them. And the whole story was the original owner bought these in 65, enlisted in the army, never came back. They sat in his house since 1965. Like kids and grandkids had played them. They've scuffed up, but it had everything. The throne, the pedals, the hi-hat stand. It just sat there as like a tribute to... I guess their grandfather who had passed away in the army. They were happy just to get it out of the house because they had to sell the, the property and get out of there. So original heads and it sounds so freaking good. So this is a prized possession I will never get rid of. It was almost like fate. Like I, I'm supposed to have these drums. Along the same lines, this Ludwig kit here, which is sandwiched between a newer RBH this is a 68 downbeat. Is that the name of it? 12, 14, 20? I think so. Yeah. Downbeat. This was my FedEx man. He had heard me playing drums. And one day he was like, I'm retiring next year and I'm moving to Florida. And I have this Ludwig drum set. I would love for someone like you to own them. So he named the price. I went over to his house, picked them up, came with a Superphonic, came with some 14 inch hi-hats that are amazing so i got this from my fedex man and i told him i will never get rid of it just the story alone of my the guy who'd been delivering me drums for 15 years was like you need to own my drums <laughs> yeah well and they're also just super versatile accessible drums yeah exactly I, and most of my newer stuff i kind of have the heads and the treatment to make them sound modern different versions of contemporary for like modern recording the old, the old Slingerland and this, I keep ratty and, and lo-fi for that vibe. So when the guy calls me up, he says, I need this just to sound like, you know, Hal Blaine in the 50s. Boom. I just set them up. I don't have to do anything to them. Or he said, give me John Bonham from Led Zeppelin 1. Like, kind of funny enough, I have the kit and I just set it up. I think I even remember you using this kit. I remember you had a series you did on YouTube a bit of like matching iconic drum sounds from any genre. I did, so um, that whole process was me learning how to engineer and tune. So I would do a song a week. I would, I would play, you know, study it, memorize every note for note, and try to get my drums to sound as close to the original in the first three days. And then the second three days was recording it and making the video of it. So for the jazz stuff, I did Roy Haynes on Reflection. I did Max Roach on um, St. Thomas. But yeah, these drums are amazing. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to kind of show us around and talk yep. about all that you're doing in content, recording, and in conjunction with Drum Factory Direct. If people want to follow you and uh, even reach out to you for lessons or things like that, what's the best way for them to get in touch? I think all of my handles are at Mike Dawson Drums. So Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube, you can reach me there. Or you can also just email me at uh, M-I-C-D-A-W at Gmail. That's the best way. All right, thanks again. Thank you.